It's October the 20th, 2011, in the second district in the city of Surti, Libya. The hot desert sun beams down on a line of 50 heavily armed trucks and troop carriers hauling ass at breakneck speed towards the city outskirts. The convoy doesn't travel for long. Within minutes, it's hit by a drone-fired missile, assaulted by local militia, and forced to weather the detonation of an airburst bomb fired from a NATO jet above. A group of survivors runs away from the convoy on foot. Among them is Muammar Gaddafi, who, until very recently, had been Libya's mad dictator. Now Gaddafi is running for his life through fields of crops and into a drain pipe that he can only hope will bring them to safety. But it was already too late. In just a few minutes more, Gaddafi will be cornered, bayoneted, and brutally beaten by the local militias before he is dragged back into that unforgiving desert sun and shot to death. The execution of Muammar Gaddafi was the culmination of a civil war that had raged within Libya for the better part of a year, one of a number of Middle Eastern and North African nations that had revolted against their dictators during 2011's Arab Spring. But even as Gaddafi's death ushered one Libyan civil war to its end, it created a tenuous peace that would hold for less than three years. Libya has endured two separate but tightly interrelated civil wars in the space of a decade. Civil wars that now, in retrospect, seem much less about the liberation of the Libyan people. Instead, they became a geopolitical chess match between many of the world's most powerful nations as Libya itself devolved into chaos and multilateral violence. The death toll has been catastrophic, the humanitarian impact unimaginable, and worst of all, there is reason to believe that Libya's current fragile peace may again unravel into a third civil war at any moment. In December 2010, a Tunisian street merchant named Mohamed Bouazizi set himself alight in an act of protest against local officials. The act set off a wave of protest in Tunisia in what was named the Jasmine Revolution, a movement that saw the country's longtime dictator ousted within a month. Inspired by the actions of the Tunisian public, young Egyptians took to the streets in January 2011, forcing their own dictator, Hosni Mubarak, out of office within just a couple of weeks. The two successful movements set off a wave in other nations in what would later be dubbed the Arab Spring. Yemen, Bahrain, Syria, and Libya all saw protests of their own which moved from peaceful demonstrations to large-scale action to open revolt. We've already mentioned Libya's dictator, Muammar Gaddafi, and how he met his end, but to give some context, Gaddafi had spent over four decades ruling Libya with an iron fist. His involvement with the bombing of a civilian airliner, his commitment to a Libyan WMD program, and his tendency to finance revolutionary movements around the world turned Libya into a pariah state and invited sanctions that hurt the Libyan people far more than they seemed to hurt Gaddafi himself. When the early days of the Arab Spring showed that the regimes of Tunisia and Egypt could be brought down, this provided all the proof of concepts the Libyan public needed. Rallies in the city of Benghazi called for Gaddafi to step down in mid-February, and when Libyan security forces responded with force to put down the protests, public discontent spread to more of Libya's cities, including the capital Tripoli. The protesters took control of Benghazi outright, and Libyan forces responded by escalating to the use of lethal force, not just by the pistols and rifles of the National Guard, but by warplanes, by tanks, and by hired mercenaries. The budding revolution had, to this point, been coordinated mostly via social media, so the regime went dark, blocking internet and telephone service throughout Libya. This brutal escalation by Gaddafi did not go unnoticed, and soon much of the world had voiced their condemnation of the regime's actions. Many of Gaddafi's own cabinet and diplomatic staff resigned, and Libyan embassies around the world rebelled, flying a version of the Libyan flag that predated Gaddafi's rule. Gaddafi refused to step down. He instead called for his own supporters to take to the streets and to fight back, and openly endorsed the use of state violence to maintain the hold on power. It's around this time that the situation in Libya spiraled from public rebellion to civil war. Individual military units began to defect toward the rebels, and the protesters began looting arms depots and capturing some of the tanks and troop carriers that had been overrun on the streets. By February the 23rd, barely a week after the first large-scale protests in Benghazi, much of the eastern part of the country had been liberated and city administrators in the west began to capitulate as well. Prior to this, Libya's tightly sealed borders and internet blackouts had prevented the Western world from learning much of what had happened, but rebel forces were able to open the Libyan border with Egypt and welcome journalists back into the country. By the end of February, Gaddafi and his military supporters had kept their hold on Tripoli, but most of Libya had either already joined the rebels or were about to. 
By now, basically the entire Western world was on the side of the rebels, but NATO and other entities were slow to send military support. Tripoli was home to a large number of foreign nationals, and one misplaced airstrike or overzealous military unit could have turned the entire situation into a global geopolitical nightmare. Instead, sanctions and asset freezing were the world's weapons of choice, and Gaddafi quickly found himself and his regime isolated not just in Libya, but globally. Although few nations were willing to supply arms and munitions to the rebels, Qatar moved in to fill the vacuum with support that would be invaluable in creating a truly organized resistance. During this time, the rebels consolidated their forces and formed the TNC, the Transitional National Council. In addition to military planning and leadership, the TNC oversaw restoration of critical infrastructure and other services in rebel-held areas and began to lay the foundation for a transitional government. This had a massive effect on both the people of Libya and the world, as it was clear to see that the TNC was already working harder for Libyans than Gaddafi had in about 40 years. However, the TNC could only do so much in a short time, and the crisis began to displace both Libyans and migrant workers. The civil war entered a period of stalemate over the next few weeks as both sides realized that they possessed very little in the way of firepower that their adversaries couldn't deal with. It's important to take into account, both now and for everything we discuss later, that Libya's vast area, low population, and geographically isolated cities make for a tactical environment where territory is a lot easier to hold than it is to claim, largely as a facet of just how few fighters there are to fill a huge battle space. The regime's holdouts in Tripoli and along the coast were well supplied and still held a military advantage, and while rebel forces' ability to move freely across the deserts and leverage the country's resources and industry went a long way, it wasn't enough for a sustained attack once the regime had dug in. The world was divided on what to do next, with the African Union and the United States opposed to military intervention, while France, the UK, and the Arab League all supported a no-fly zone. In mid-March, the decision would be made for them, as Gaddafi's first major counter-attack advanced towards Benghazi and Tobruk. The UN Security Council approved a no-fly zone and Gaddafi quickly declared a ceasefire, but in typical Gaddafi fashion, it quickly became clear that this was more of an attempt at appeasement than anything he would enforce among the loyalist forces. On March the 19th, the first coalition warplanes and missiles set upon Syria, and within days, US and European forces had completely knocked out Libyan air warfare capacity. These airstrikes turned the tide of the war, with rebels now emboldened to advance as the regime's holdout cities and advance camps were picked apart from above. NATO officially took over the coalition action at the end of March, and though the African Union tried to broker a peace, the fighting continued throughout the month of April. Several European nations sent advisers to assist the rebel forces, and by June, many among Gaddafi's inner circle had either defected or been killed. Tripoli was Gaddafi's final stronghold, and one he held through months of fierce fighting in the unimaginably hot Libyan summer. But August saw yet another change of fortune for the dictator when rebel forces converged on Tripoli and took many strategic holdings in the outskirts. On August the 23rd, the rebels broke through and captured Gaddafi's compound amidst intense battles across the cityscape. However, Gaddafi himself was nowhere to be found, and when the rebels consolidated authority in Tripoli a few weeks later, they were able to confirm that Gaddafi was no longer in the city. With the rebels in control of Tripoli, the regime's forces had entered the TNC's endgame. Although Gaddafi attempted to garner support with occasional audio messages he distributed over regime-held parts of Libya, the last remaining cities began to capitulate to the TNC. On September the 15th, the UN recognized the TNC as the voice of the Libyan people, and many cities and towns surrendered peacefully to the TNC's authority. By this time, only two cities held out against the rebels, Serti and Bani Walid. But after another month of fighting, Gaddafi himself was discovered, pinned down in Serti with nowhere to go. He was cornered, and he was put to death by the rebels, and as he died, Libya's first civil war came to a close. The TNC had achieved total victory within Libya, an outcome that would have seemed unthinkable just a year prior. Not only that, but Libya itself had been resuscitated from its previous stature as a pariah state, and foreign military support gave way to foreign aid and support in rebuilding the war-torn nation. We would love to say that this was the end of Libya's troubles, that the TNC had been able to hand over authority to a popular and peacefully elected new government, and that Libya today was in the middle of an economic and social recovery on the scale of South Korea from the 1960s to the present day, or Japan after World War II. However, we will instead direct your attention to the total runtime of this video, which should probably clue you into the fact that Libya's troubles were... 
well, far from over. Unfortunately for the TNC, their status as the major and internationally recognized anti-Gaddafi force in Libya did not mean that their support was absolute, not even among the patchwork of militias who had fought for Libya's freedom. The TNC had been able to restore services to much of the country with the help of Western backers, but they had far less success establishing a functioning transitional government. With only a weak capacity to enforce order and exert influence in Libya's cities, the TNC was unable to prevent many independent militias from taking control over portions of the country. Libya is far from a cultural monolith with a wide range of tribal and ethnic groups who had all been eager for an opportunity to self-govern in the regime's absence. So, a foreign-backed government formed mostly in the eastern parts of the country didn't exactly appeal to the unaffiliated resistance groups in the West. The bigger problem from the TNC's perspective wasn't just that these militias were averse to cooperating with the central authority. The real issue was that they were armed. And they were prone to frequent skirmishes with each other and the TNC's forces. On January the 4th, 2012, several militias had a shootout in downtown Tripoli, a further sign of the TNC's relative inability to control their own territory. Between the militia's continued violence and the TNC's slow progress towards national reform, many Libyan citizens became frustrated and another round of protests broke out. The first set of nationwide free elections was set for June 2012, but during the intervening time, reports emerged that rebel militias had continued to kill and torture Libyan citizens who they perceived to be Gaddafi loyalists. Several cities and regions attempted to formally establish autonomous or semi-autonomous status and were just barely reined back in by the TNC. Foreign concerns grew over the Libyan justice system's ability to fairly prosecute former members of the regime, and as the election date grew closer, the world watched with growing unease. The elections took place in early July with the National Forces Alliance, a secular party that formed a direct offshoot of the TNC, winning a plurality of seats in the new National Assembly. Although this result probably wasn't what many of the militia forces wanted, it was enough to pacify both the Libyan public and the international observers and gave Libyan authorities valuable time and breathing room to work toward reconstruction. But the newly stable government got thrown on its head on the night of September the 11th, 2012, when about 150 Islamist militants loosely affiliated with Al-Qaeda stormed an American compound in Benghazi. During the attack, the US ambassador to Libya was killed, and two coordinated attacks on a nearby CIA outfit killed two agency personnel. This was a really big deal, not just because it royally pissed off Libya's supporters in the United States, but because it indicated just how little control the ruling government had over local militant groups. Twelve days after the attack, Benghazi's own residents pushed the militias from their city and the government was able to extract them from military bases two days later. But after a quiet winter, a terror attack against a Sufi shrine in Tripoli and a controversial ban on political participation by ex-regime officials lit off tensions again. The situation in Libya began to spiral back toward open conflict in August 2013, when a political leader in the East blockaded access to four key oil depots. His demands included a greater level of autonomy and self-governance in the eastern provinces, and though the Libyan government didn't give in, a year-long stalemate would cost Tripoli billions in lost oil revenues. In October, a government-funded militia briefly kidnapped the Prime Minister, which frankly isn't really what you look for in a stable democracy, and in the new year, secular militias threatened an attack on Tripoli after an Islamist coalition within the National Assembly extended the Assembly's time in office. This series of events prompted a nationwide loss of faith in the government, with voter turnout under 50% in an election meant to send a diverse and ethnically inclusive group of representatives to draft a new constitution. As voter participation went down, violence increased, with the ongoing oil crisis worsened by new wars between militias and local authorities over the vital resource. The Islamist coalition within the National Assembly nominated a new prime minister when the old one stepped down, but the new PM lost his seat in barely more than a month. It's around this time that a new major player in Libya took center stage, a man who will be instrumental in the chaos that comes next. So, meet General Khalifa Haftar, then a militia commander in the eastern provinces around Benghazi. Haftar had cut his teeth as one of Gaddafi's early supporters and a member of the coup that had seen Gaddafi take power in 1969. But he had lived in exile in the United States for two decades after a disastrous military expedition into Chad. Haftar used his time in the United States to cultivate murky relationships with U.S. intelligence and assumed a role leading rebel forces during the First Civil War. 
But after a quiet few years observing the work of the transitional government, Haftar returned to the national spotlight in Libya when he launched Operation Dignity, an initiative that he claimed would save Libya from the overreaches of Parliament. Haftar's cooperation came at a time when Benghazi had fallen under the control of Ansar al-Sharia, the same group that had been behind the death of the U.S. ambassador to Libya in 2012. The government had failed to stand up to Ansar al-Sharia, who had since begun a wave of assassinations and targeted attacks on military and police in Benghazi. Haftar had little money to support Operation Dignity, but he had the backing of a disillusioned and frustrated Libyan public. Although his target initially was Ansar al-Sharia, this mandate later expanded to include all Islamists within Libya. In a new set of parliamentary elections, again marked by low voter turnout, Islamist parties also took a hit. Violence between Haftar's forces and Ansar al-Sharia continued to ramp up, and at the end of July, Ansar al-Sharia was able to secure strategic parts of the city and declare it to be an Islamic caliphate. Elsewhere, Islamists have been incensed at Haftar's assault on Benghazi, and over a five-week firefight, the Libya Dawn coalition of Islamists took Tripoli by force. The newly elected parliament was powerless to oppose them, and was eventually run out of town completely, taking refuge in the city of Tobruk. This turn of events led to an alliance between the new parliament, known as the House of Representatives, or HOR, and Haftar's Libyan National Army, the LNA. The situation continued to deteriorate, and Egypt and the UAE began to carry out airstrikes against the Islamists in Tripoli, which they later denied. Undeterred, the Islamists declared a new parliament in Tripoli, and on the 1st of October 2014, Haftar's forces began a new offensive toward Benghazi. Although the start of Operation Dignity back in May is widely regarded today as the start of Libya's Second Civil War, it's around October that the country spiraled completely out of control for the second time in just a few years. With Libya's Islamist militias aligned together on one side and Haftar and the newly elected parliament firmly on the other, the lines were set for a conflict that was destined to be far bigger and far more catastrophic than even the 2011 Civil War had been. At this moment, we'd like to reassure our viewers that if things have started to seem a bit confusing, it's actually okay. You're not alone. Especially you, Peter. We know you're just doing your best. But this is the moment where the situation in Libya shifts from being complex to being, well, borderline unintelligible from the perspective of a casual observer. So we'd like to take a moment and just outline some of the major players who are going to be most important to us today as we move forward. This will require a little bit of skipping ahead in the timeline, as some of these factions only become prominent later, but trust me here, it's worth getting it all out in the open now. It'll make it all a lot easier to follow. We're going to start with the two major opposing sides. The General National Congress, the GNC, made from the remnants of the parliaments elected in 2012, and the Libyan National Army, the LNA, joined by the House of Representatives elected to parliament in 2014. The GNC was the major Islamist faction within Libya, based in Tripoli, and exercising strong control over the coastal cities and the Nafusa Mountains in the south. Their major military component was the Libya Dawn, a conglomeration of militias that seized control of significant military hardware, including planes, from major bases across the country. The Libya Dawn received major support from a second militia conglomerate, Libya Shield, as well as a wide network of other Islamist militias who preferred to operate independently. The GNC's ideological backing spans the broad spectrum of Islamism, which is itself less of a single movement than a massive collection of complex and often opposed ideologies. However, they all shared a history of persecution, exile, and imprisonment under Gaddafi, whose memory was a powerful factor toward their general group collaboration. Opposite them is the LNA, our aforementioned alliance between General Haftar and the 2014 Parliament, the House of Representatives. The LNA gains the support of a large portion of the Libyan military, as well as significant amounts of hardware. Although Haftar relied greatly on the House of Representatives to support his mandate within Libya, the House had only nominal authority over Haftar's actions for most of the war. The LNA was supported by a number of anti-Islamist militias, most prominently the Zintan militia, which held the western city of Zintan. The city of Tobruk formed the LNA's power base for much of the conflict, with additional holdings across much of the east. However, the Second Civil War was by no means a bilateral conflict, with jihadist forces comprising a third element that was often just as happy to war with other jihadists as they were to war against the GNC and the LNA. 
This group included the aforementioned Ansar al Sharia, the Derna Mujahideen Shura Council, and the Ajdabiya Revolutionary Shura Council, all of whom held a constantly morphing assortment of cities, towns, and villages over the course of the war. Also active in the conflict were ethnic Tubu and Toreg militias, with the Tubu protecting the land near the Chadian border and the Toreg holding out across a large slice of the Algerian border. The territory those militias held would change and evolve rapidly during the Civil War, as would the holdings of every other other major factions, so it's an unfortunate overgeneralization to tie them to one specific region of the country. However, we'll stick with that in the interest of not keeping you here for several days straight. This video is already long enough. Finally, we have the Islamic State, who emerged within Libya in 2015 in and around the eastern city of Derna. IS would quickly gain allegiance and support from other groups in the area, a known hub of jihadist activity, and they would eventually take control of Sirte, the same city where Gaddafi was both born and eventually killed. In their typical fashion, Islamic State cells spread widely throughout Libya and attracted significant support from sub-Saharan jihadists who arrived in Libya to fill their ranks. This mess of competing factions would evolve continuously over the course of the war, with allegiances often shifting rapidly among individual militias and broader interest groups, but these general group labels will do a functional enough job demarcating each side of the war. However, if you do have a little bit of brain space left for one more level of complexity, well, buckle up, because we've still got to discuss how, you know, the rest of the world factors in. For those who feel confidence in their understanding of modern geopolitics, well, get ready to throw everything you know out of the window, because even though the conflict has been largely ignored by the general public, it has been a nine-dimensional quantum chess match at the high levels of diplomacy. Now, listen closely to the list of who supports who, and you'll quickly see what we mean. Supporting the GNC in Tripoli, we've got Iran, the United States, Qatar, the UK, Turkey, Pakistan, Italy, and most of the European Union. On the opposite side, back in the LNA in Tobruk, we've got Russia, France, the UAE, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Greece, Jordan, and allegedly Israel, although it's a bit of a sensitive topic. Other major world powers stayed intentionally neutral on the issue, most notably China. This spiderweb of allegiances often directly subverts what we would generally expect from the international order, but then again, a lot of rules can go out of the window when Libya's rich oil fields are up for grabs. Not only that, but nations who were generally opposed to the spread of Islamist rule had strong incentives to support Haftar, while nations interested in either supporting Islamist movements or accessing the natural resources on GNC territory uh, would support the GNC. And like anything else, those lists were subject to change. For example, the strongman generalship of Haftar seemed to impress former US President Donald Trump even after the United States' early support for Tripoli. With each side mapped out and global networks of support firmly established, the only thing left is just watch the dominoes fall and fall they did, in a brutal process that began in earnest on October the 19th, 2014, when the Tobruk parliament sealed their alliance with Haftar's forces. This concordant military, political, and economic opposition to the Islamist government in Tripoli was the final point of no return from which the Second Libyan Civil War became inevitable. Unfortunately, we can't take you through every single strategic push by every side within the war, as that would keep us here for the better part of a week. Instead, we'll focus on the major battles and sequences of conflict. Late in 2014, saw Haftar's forces adopt a policy of tactical air raids against a range of targets, both in Tripoli and in other cities across Libya. Tripoli responded in kind with Operation Sunrise, a prolonged battle over oil terminals in the city of Sirte. Around the same time, the Islamic State assumed full control of Derna, a strategically important port city. Early in 2015, the UN attempted a series of peace talks between the two sides, which broke down completely within a week. Shortly after, Haftar's forces surged into Benghazi and captured its central military base from the GNC. In February of 2015, airstrikes began against Islamic State targets carried out by Egypt after 21 Egyptian Christians were beheaded. The airstrikes did little to deter Islamic State forces, who continued expanding outward until they reached the strategic city of Sirte. By June, they had locked down the city, pushing back Tripoli's forces as they did so. Peace talks between Tripoli and Tobruk again failed, but both sides saw a temporary respite from the assault of the Islamic State when IAS was held responsible for the death of an Al-Qaeda leader. This set up Al-Qaeda to declare war on the Islamic State in Libya. 
Another attempt toward peace was substantially more successful, at least for a little while, when in December 2015 the UN brokered a deal to integrate both Tripoli and Tobruk into a new government. This organization, called the Government of National Accord, or GNA, would rely on shared political leadership by the prominent politicians of both sides. The GNA actually got up and running in Tripoli by 2016, and the Islamist factions entered into the terms of the peace deal voluntarily. However, Tobruk disengaged from the peaceful solution, meaning that the the GNA essentially became the new political faction where the General National Congress had previously been. As such, we'll be referring to the Tripoli-based Islamist faction as the GNA from here on out. The GNA earned recognition from the US and much of the world as Libya's new legitimate government, a move that Haftar and his allies in Tobruk obviously were not very happy about. But they could only do so much as the GNA were able to consolidate support from a wider range of militias than before and begin pushing back toward Islamic State controlled Surti. The United States stepped in to support in the form of airstrikes it directly coordinated with GNA leaders. The Islamic State had become a mutual problem for both the GNA and Tobruk by this time, and although direct collaboration simply wasn't going to happen, the GNA's Operation Impenetrable Wall against Surti received unofficial support in the form of Haftar's own offensive toward Islamic State held Derna. In this brief moment of functional alliance, Tripoli and Tobruk were able to expel the Islamic State from both cities, relegating them to pockets of Libyan territory for the rest of the war. In late November 2016, Haftar made a direct appeal to Russia for support. Today, a Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, is better known for his public defense of the Russian invasion into Ukraine, but back in 2016, he was the man who oversaw collaboration between Moscow and Tobruk. Libya and the Mediterranean Basin have been important to Putin's Russia for years in their efforts to establish a modern great power hegemony like the US or China, and a strong man like Haftar was ideal to establish a new client state. Tripoli spiraled into violence again during this time with clashes between rival Islamist militias spilling out into the streets amidst tank and sniper fire. And just to make it clear how complicated the situation still was, much of the Tripoli cityscape was under the control of a different self-declared government that was not the GNA, even as the GNA's officials continued to live and work out of the area. Violence between this government and the GNA continued to persist into 2017, and through the war and afterward, it's been clear that the GNA's authority in Tripoli is only as absolute as the militias decide to allow. By May of 2017, Haftar was yet again attempting to take control of Benghazi after consolidating his gains in the surrounding area. Also in May, Ansar al-Sharia finally admitted defeat after being whittled down by Haftar's army. The group dissolved itself voluntarily, with many of its remaining fighters scattering toward other militias. This went a long way toward Haftar's conquest of Benghazi, which he finally declared official on July 6, 2017. Given the battles that took place in Benghazi on July the 7th, 2017, it's fair to assume that the announcement might have been premature, but Haftar appeared to gain confidence from his victory. On the 25th of July, Haftar agreed to a ceasefire brokered by France and endorsed by the GNA. The terms of the ceasefire called for a series of elections in early 2018, but by October 2017, UN efforts to hammer out a peace deal seemed to stall yet again. In December, Haftar threw his own hat into the ring for the upcoming elections, declaring the GNA illegitimate and claiming that the people of Libya would be the ones to decide who truly deserved to lead the nation. This proved to be too large of a barrier to overcome in time, and the spring of 2018 elections just never took place. But the spring of 2018 was still critical to the conflict for another reason. General Haftar's health. On the 11th of April, Haftar was rushed to Paris due to a stroke. Initial reports indicated that Haftar might have died or become gravely ill, but his return to Benghazi 15 days later disproved that theory. Within a few days, Haftar had ordered another offensive towards Derna, which had slipped from his grasp after Tobruk's forces had captured it from the Islamic State. But he also attended a major meeting in Paris on May the 29th, one in which a range of Libyan leaders, including the GNA's prime minister, worked with international partners to commit to a final peace. All sides consented to the peace deal, which called for parliamentary and presidential elections by year's end. Although independent guerrillas, ethnic militias, jihadist forces, and local gangs still had no intention of cooperating peacefully, the major players had finally agreed to bring the matter to a close. The rest of 2018 saw a few big ups for Libya alongside a number of ongoing crises. On the positive end, oil-hungry world governments had reason to celebrate in July when many of Libya's major oil terminals reopened for business. Tripoli's airport was able to reopen and many displaced Libyans were finally able to return to what remained of their homes. Another conference, this one in Palermo, Italy, gained agreement from all participating sides to come together and plan elections that were now pushed the following spring. 
But these months were marred by violence as independent actors within Libya pushed back against a peace that might threaten their autonomy or their profit margins. In the late summer, Tripoli came under assault from a group of militias with fierce fighting that would be sustained for a month. In September, 400 inmates rioted and were able to escape from prison, and just days later, Libya's national oil company was attacked by alleged Islamic State insurgents. The country's largest oil field came under attack in December, as did the Libyan foreign ministry. In response to the violence, Haftar and Tobruk forces turned their attention southward to the many rebel factions that still remained there. They wrestled back control of the captured oil fields and launched a brutal assault on the city of Mazu. But both they and the GNA and Tripoli maintained their commitment to peace. Or well, they did until April the 3rd, 2019, just two weeks before the scheduled start of the national conference that would finalize Libya's peace, when Haftar decided to launch an all-out assault on GNA-controlled Tripoli. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN, had arrived that same day, and he got a front-row seat at the start of the battle that would continue for months. Haftar claimed that his surprise attack was all in service to his ongoing efforts to root out Libya's terrorist factions, but the forces resisting him around Tripoli were firmly allied to the GNA. His true motives could have been anything, from delusions of grandeur to a tactical miscalculation to the effects of brain damage in the wake of his stroke. But whatever the reason, Haftar set off a round of fighting that would prolong the war by almost an entire year. Both sides seemed to recognize that this would be the final battle, one way or the other, and many of the independent militias must have felt the same. They allied with the two major factions to a greater degree than ever before, each picking the side they believed to stand the best chance of victory. This series of battles would see Haftar's forces struggle for months to gain a foothold around Tripoli, a mission they would eventually accomplish with the capture of Tripoli's major airport. Tobruk gained major support from Sudan, who sent a thousand veteran soldiers to relieve pressure on Haftar's forces to protect areas far from Tripoli. These Sudanese fighters had cut their teeth perpetrating the genocide of Darfur, and to this point Haftar's actions had shown that this was probably just the kind of fighter that he was looking for. Tobruk's forces had taken to indiscriminate airstrikes, often targeting ambulances, hospitals, and refugee processing and holding centers. Also on the target list apparently were an equestrian school and a biscuit factory. The Tobruk forces were able to surge into the city of Surti by early 2020, whilst flat out dismissing Russian attempts to find a ceasefire. During this time, Haftar gained large support from the UAE in direct violation of the UN's arms embargo. Haftar's territorial gains continued through the end of March as peace talks stopped and started and then stopped again. But the tide turned in the beginning of April, when the GNA's Operation Peace Storm was able to reclaim a number of towns. The GNA battered Haftar's forces to the point that Haftar tried to unilaterally laterally declare a ceasefire for Ramadan, which the GNA leaders presumably laughed at before continuing the counterattack. By June of 2020, Tripoli was back under the GNA control, and their forces were en route to Certe. The two sides stalemated here, largely due to the effects of Russian support in rescuing Haftar's collapsing defense. The Russian paramilitary force known as the Wagner Group, currently gaining infamy as the perpetrators of some of the worst acts in the Ukraine conflict, have been instrumental in counterattacking the GNA. They have led the capture of oil fields, formed a vanguard for Haftar's advance, and their snipers have terrorized adversaries all across the battle space. In a major scandal, the former CEO of the American paramilitary organization Blackwater had also sent elite mercenaries and equipment into the conflict. But the GNA was receiving their own support at this time, largely from Turkey, and their supply of veteran combatants out of Syria, a move that was drawing Egypt closer and closer to sending its own troops to support Haftar. Major global players started to edge toward direct conflict on the ground in Libya, but after months of brutal, attritional warfare, Tobruk and Tripoli had both done all they could. At risk of being overrun by a war between their respective backers, the outcome basically no Libyan leader wanted, both sides finally agreed to a ceasefire. After six and a half brutal years, the second Libyan civil war was over. With peace finally restored, the Tobruk and Tripoli governments were charged with fleshing out what a stable and mutually amenable Libya would look like. Oh, with help from the United Nations, delegates from across the country agreed to a few key terms. Displaced Libyans would be resettled in their homes, most participating factions would receive amnesty, and free and fair elections would be held within 18 months. Other components of the peace plan included registry and demobilization of Libya's militias, the expulsion of all foreign mercenaries, and steps to rehabilitate the Libyan economy. And by all accounts, the peace deal, so far, has held. At the time this video was written, neither the former Tripoli or Tobruk factions have restarted hostilities. However, the planned presidential and parliamentary elections, initially expected to take place on December the 24th, 2021, 
still haven't been carried out. Delegates in charge of the process failed to come to terms on a set schedule for the electoral process, a clear list of powers granted to Parliament and the President, or the inclusion and exclusion lists of potential candidates of political parties. Individual actors within the transitional parliaments have attempted to take control of the process, all with various end objectives, in a process that has just seemed to grow everybody's frustration by the end. One of Muammar Gaddafi's own sons has announced his candidacy, as has the interim prime minister and, of course, Khalifa Haftar. The country's ability to keep elections free and fair was also in question as militias and military groups within Libya couldn't actually be stopped from influencing elections at a local level. This led to a complete breakdown in the electoral planning process, one that still has not been resolved. As of now, there is no date scheduled for a presidential or parliamentary election, and Haftar himself has recently signaled that his patience with the entire process is wearing thin. Haftar's statements are just one among many factors that foreign policy experts now implicate as early indicators that Libya's peace may not hold for much longer. Although the Russian invasion of Ukraine has captured diplomatic attention throughout the world, 2022 has seen a slow descent back into unrest for Libya. Well, with the UN forced to cut corners and make somewhat desperate deals in order to keep the peace process afloat, many international backers are beginning to hold the whole process at arm's length, and many Libyans dismiss it outright. Parts of the nation now serve as hotbeds for gun runners and gangs, and Russian influence over the area has continued to spread. Infant mortality, education availability, access to clean water and electricity, and local economies have all failed to recover from their catastrophic spiral during the war. Emboldened by the flagging negotiations, militias have begun to fight in the streets of Tripoli again, with one skirmish in August leading to the deaths of over 30 people. The Tripoli and Tobruk governments seemed to yet again be the puppet masters behind this incident, with the involved militias being firmly backed by each side. There are some positive signs that the two sides have reconciled since then, and in a flagrant break of our own fourth war here on War of Graphics, it's worth noting that on the day this sentence was written, that's January the 5th, 2023, delegates from both Tripoli and Tobruk announced that they will soon present a new roadmap to free and fair elections. Hopefully, uh, they presented said roadmap by the time you see this video, and uh, we'll keep optimistic that it may lead to a broader and more sustainable agreement. But at this moment, there are simply no guarantees that this plan will succeed where so many others have failed. The prolonged conflict in Libya offers myriad lessons on what not to do, both from the perspective of a national elite and that of an intervening foreign actor. Over a cumulative seven and a half years of the war, Gaddafi, the rebels of 2011, the Islamist government in Tripoli, the Haftar government in Tobruk, Ansar al-Sharia, the Islamic State, thousands of individual militias, the US, Russia, the European Union, the Gulf States, and the United Nations all failed in achieving their objectives. In their wake, they have left death, devastation, and a peace that seems almost too fragile to hold. At best, we can look to a temporarily sated Western appetite for oil, and a vague announcement to expect an announcement, just hours old at the time of this writing, as the good news here. But whether either of these things are good news very much depends on who you ask. For those in the West who celebrated the Arab Spring as it happened and held a sense of genuine optimism that it could change things in the region, it's difficult to square the reality of Libya's first civil war with the eventuality of its second. But it's important to keep in mind the sobering reality that the people of Libya are today poorer, in greater danger, and even less able to exercise their own political will in their home country than they were under Muammar Gaddafi before the revolution of 2011 ever took place. That's certainly not an argument that Gaddafi should have been kept in place, but the state of Libya today was dictated by a long series of conflicting objectives and poor decisions, both from Libyan elites and the international community. In Libya, as in so many war-torn places around the world, we find ourselves searching for a least worst option, and spending the better part of a decade in civil war was absolutely not the least worst option. As the Libyan ceasefire continues to hold day by day, we can only hope that one day it will evolve into a lasting peace, and here's hoping that we don't have to eat these words.